Hi everyone, I'm Ada. I'm a sophomore at Duke studying computer science and environmental science and policy. Hello everyone, my name is Jesse and I'm a junior studying computer science and statistics. Hi everyone, I'm Wendy. I am a senior studying computer science and economics. Hey, I'm Eddie. I'm a junior studying computer science like everyone else in math. Hi everyone, I'm Tyler. I'm a sophomore studying electrical and computer engineering and computer science. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Luis Moscoso. I am a graduate student in the Master of Interdisciplinary Data Science, Duke. And welcome again to, to this presentation. We are very excited to share our journey with the Bus Connections in 2020, 2021. Today, we're gonna be showing our results on energy infrastructure detection using synthetic magic on the wind turbine. So next slide, please. So as Kyle mentioned before, we have built our progress upon the success of previous bus connections and data class projects. Uh, in this map, we are showing a 2017 result of the World Bank where they spot locations where there are still lack to electricity and willing lack to electricity to other uh, to lack to other fundamental needs uh, such as uh, opportunities to improve the quality of life of these locations through teleeducation, telemedicine, or anything that could, could be provided remote. Uh, whereas in this map, the areas uh, of, with lack to electricity focus on Africa and South Asia. Uh, this comes from a pre-COVID era. So after COVID, due to mobility limitations, the number of communities that require remote services today has increased uh, and important increase, and we can see that, next slide please, in locations that previously were not considered like Brazil and Mexico. So the access to electricity or energy has become even more critical nowadays. So any effort to accelerate the access to these services is now even more appreciated. Next slide, please. So how do we start with this process? First, uh, we need to provide information about the current location of energy infrastructure and their features so energy developers, policymakers can know how to extend the location of these grids to the new to the new communities that are actually unattended, or in the case of distributed energy resources and developers of distributed energy resources, how they can connect those new hubs of power to the grid. The problem is always, as always, next slide, please, I learned. The access to information is not really available. So nowadays, the update of the information is based, is based on ground uh, activities like site service, which then goes, someone takes notes of new, new location, updates on database, and then this is reflected to some map, which in a number of months can be publicly or not publicly available, which still made it, makes this uh, process difficult. So how can we uh, improve the, the speed of all this process? Next slide, please. Well, some approaches has been already implemented using machine learning. By instance, this is a case of the World Bank that developed in June 2018. They released results. This map is from Pakistan. They start with uh, read information on the left. And using machine learning methods, they were able to uh, predict and make inference about the location of this infra infrastructure. What did they apply for these uh, methodologies? Next slide, please, Tyler. They use object detection. So basically, after training a machine learning model on a large data set of quality annotation with, of the object of interest, in this case, we can use electric towers. They put new images on, the, on this machine learning model. One click, please, Tyler and they will get the bounding boxes with the location and the classification of the objects within these boxes. So now, Eddie, this looks promising, right? So Eddie is gonna talk about some challenges ahead. Yep, so let's talk about wind turbines real quick. So basically our focus in our work has been centered on wind turbines, mostly for two reasons. One is because we have readily available data in the US and they're pretty large. So that means it's pretty easy for these uh, object detection models to detect them. So we might've started with the transmission towers that Jose just showed. 
And of course, like with our goal to expand access uh, to energy planning in other regions with not as much infrastructure, we might focus on solar panels, for example, in the future or something like that. So there's two parts of our, our approach so far. The first is we collect some overhead imagery, whether that be through satellite imagery, flying some drones or some airplanes and just taking pictures. The second part is we take all that data and what we need to do is take thousands of those data and label these, this certain like infrastructure such as turbines. Then we feed it into a deep learning model and the deep learning model basically takes in these images and figures out a bunch of numbers and parameters to be able to spit out some bounding box labels on the right where it says, hey, there's a wind turbine here in the image. So this has two problems. The first, like I said, is this requires thousands of labeled images where we have to pass in bounding boxes for each object into the model. That's a problem because energy infrastructure is pretty rare. So if I take any like random space in the US, it's unlikely I'll just find a couple wind turbines to label. So collecting and labeling satellite imagery or overhead imagery in general is just gonna be very expensive if we do it by hand. The second more interesting problem is that these deep learning models don't generalize very well yet. So in other words, if I feed it a bunch of training images that look like the ones on the left, you can imagine they're very like green, like forests or grasslands. If I feed that into the deep learning model, it will learn to do well on that kind of data. But on data on the right, let's say we're in a new region with more a more desert-like geography, the deep learning model is just not going to do as well, especially if these wind turbines now are like smaller, as you can see. So to solve these two problems, we're gonna introduce something really cool, which is synthetic imagery. And that's gonna be the main focus of our talk today. So on the top, we have two real images. These are a couple of examples of what we feed into the deep learning model typically. And then on the bottom, these are synthetic images that we've actually created to mimic the real images. So not only do we feed in those two top real images, we also can feed those two bottom synthetic images to the deep learning model so that the deep learning model can learn from more data and perhaps more generalized data to do well. So now I'm gonna pass the remote to Tyler, who's gonna talk about our specific methodology for running the experiment. Yeah, hi everyone. So we have this synthetic data and now the goal here in our methodology is going to be testing whether this data can, this synthetic data can help improve the performance of our object detection model. And so we have, uh, we're gonna run through a couple steps here. The first step of which is to collect and label real images. These uh, orange boxes represent the, uh, the labels for these wind turbines. Um, and then the second step is to generate the synthetic images once we have the synthetic images and the real images, we can construct two different data sets and run the experiments. And we'll show a little preview of the experiments here. Um, we can have two different training data sets, one of which uh, we have, well, for both of these, we have the same uh, composition real images. And then for our second data set here on the bottom, we can add in these synthetic images. And then we can train these uh, train the model on these two different data sets, test it. And um, what we expect is that because we add in synthetic images, uh, these, this helps overcome the issue of a lack of data. And also in this case where we're training on these brownish images and testing on these uh, more farmland images because the synthetic images looks more similar to the uh, testing images here, we expect that it also help the model uh, generalize to this other domain. And so we'll just go through step by step here. The first step is to collect and label real images. So here uh, for this, we use a data set called NAEP, which has high resolution imagery available all across the US, which makes it very good for this project. And so we collected images in three different domains and we split it up by state here. So we have 
the northwest up in the top left. It was generally a brownish hue. You can see here desert, some grasslands. And then this other domain here we called Eastern Midwest, uh, which is more greenish and farmland. And then we have Northeast, which is mostly forests and also very green. And the idea here is that the imagery in Northwest looks similar, like self-similar, and looks different from that in the Eastern Midwest or the Northeast. And the next step here is just labeling the images. Uh, this is so that the object detection model knows where these uh, turbines are. So then we can train it on that and it'll learn how to predict these, uh, the turbines, the location of the turbines. And then the next step is to generate the synthetic images. So for this, we use a software called City Engine. Uh, basically, we can have a list of background images and a 3D model of a wind turbine. And the software will automatically place the background image onto a 3D scene. And then the 3D model can be, will be um, generated randomly across this background image. And then we can automatically position a camera in the overhead, uh, overhead view, and it'll capture images like you can see on the right here. And the benefit of this is that it's, uh, it has these automatic labels um, and so it's a lot less time consuming than doing this by hand, which, which is why uh, synthetic imagery is so useful. Here we have some example uh, synthetic imagery. Um, here we have a wide variety of camera angles and background images. Uh, and we had a couple design considerations when making this synthetic imagery. The first of which is the size of the turbines. Uh, for this issue, we modeled the size distribution in our real imagery of the wind turbines, and then we copied this in our synthetic imagery. Uh, for the angle of camera, uh, we noticed that many of the real images were taken at an angle where you can see the pole of the turbine in here. And so we copied this in our synthetic imagery where it's taken at an angle. And then we also have to choose the background images to use for our synthetic data. And we sampled background images nearby the testing image locations so that um, all of these are so that the synthetic imagery looks as close as possible to our real imagery. And we expect because it looks closer, the object in the object detection model performs better on images that are similar to what it's seen than this uh, adding these similar synthetic images will will improve the performance. Now I'll hand it off to Jesse. We'll talk more about the other steps. Thanks, Tyler. Now Tyler has walked us through collecting and labeling images. Now we're ready to construct our data sets and run experiments on it. So our first question we wanna consider when it comes to constructing data set is how much synthetic data should we use? If we add too much synthetic data, then we run the risk of overfitting. However, if we add too little, then synthetic data is not gonna change our performance significantly. In order to figure out what is the optimal real to synthetic ratio that we should use, we designed a series of experiments where we tested varying real to synthetic ratio. And after conducting all these experiments, we find that one to 0 0.75 yields the largest increase in performance. And because of this, we decided to stick with 1 to 0 0.75 as a real to synthetic ratio. This means that for every 100 real images, we add 75 synthetic images. Next, we wanna consider what object detection model we wanna use. There are many different object detection models that exist in the deep learning space. And we chose to use YOLO v3 for its short training time. Short training time usually comes at the cost of performance. However, our goal for this experiment is to evaluate the relative performance change after adding synthetic data. And therefore, the absolute performance is not as relevant for our purposes. And YOLO v3 is a desirable choice. So now we have constructed our data sets. We are ready to run experiments and test our hypothesis. So you might be 
been wondering at this point, how does this all relate back to energy access problem that Jose was talking about earlier? Well, if you recall, there are a few key challenges in the access, energy access planning space. One is that there's a lack of labeled data in the target domain where we want to deploy our energy resources to. Here, we define a domain as a geographic region, and a source domain is where we drew our real data from, and a target domain is where we want to deploy our energy resources to. So one scenario is when your target domain, such as the Pacific uh, Northwest, has limited examples of labeled real data. For this scenario, our source domain will remain the same geographic region as our target domain as evident by the overlapping circles shown here. And because of this, this is called a within domain experiment where the target and the source are the same domain. A, net, a second scenario that's arguably a lot more challenging is when your target domain such as the Northeast has no examples of labeled real data. And because your target domain has no um, data, you have to draw data from an alternative domain, which is a source domain, such as the Pacific Northwest. So here, because the source and target are, come from different domains, we call this a cross-domain experiment. And note that even though here I show examples from the continental US, in reality, your target domain is likely a less developed area that doesn't have reliable access to electricity yet, whereas your source domain is likely a developed country that has readily available data. Now we are ready to dive into more details about each experiment. So for within domain experiment, recall this is a case where our target domain has limited real data. Our goal is to test whether adding synthetic data is going to improve our model accuracy. In order to do that, we first have to establish some baseline where we add no synthetic data. And then we augment our baseline data set with 75 synthetic target images. And then we compare the model performance on the baseline data set versus the adding synthetic data set. Here, adding synthetic data provides more examples of images that have wind turbines. And these wind turbines might also have more variations as well as variations in background. And therefore, we expect that augmenting our data set with synthetic data is going to improve our model accuracy. Next, we can um, go into more details about the cross domain experiment. And recall that this is a case where your target domain has no real data. And therefore, you must draw data from an alternative domain. So, like before, um, we need to establish some baseline where we add no synthetic data. And the goal of our cross domain experiment is to test whether synthetic data is going to improve our model generalizability. Recall from earlier, um, Eddie talked about a domain adaptation problem, where if your training data and testing data look dissimilar, your model is really hard for your model to achieve good performance. We augmented our baseline data sets with 75 synthetic target images. Note that these synthetic images come from your target domain. Therefore, adding synthetic data not only provides more examples, but it provides examples that are more similar to a target domain. And therefore, you can expect that the model is going to do better when on the um, augmented data set that has synthetic data. Next, I will pass it on to Ada, who is going to talk about our results. Thank you, Jesse. Now we present our results from the aforementioned experiments. But before seeing the results, next slide, please. Note that the metric we are using to evaluate the results is called average precision. And to understand this, consider these two concepts. The first one is precision. It measures how accurate are our predictions. So out of the things we classified as wind turbines, how many were actually wind turbines? A second concept is called recall. It measures how well the model found all the wind turbines. So out of the wind turbines in the image, how many did we find? So in this example image, we made a total of four predictions and two of them are correct. So our position is two over four and there are a total of three wind turbines in the image and we found two of them. So our recall is two over three. An average position 
is the average of precision values at all possible recall values. Also notice that in the machine learning space, even the small absolute increase in average precision like 0.01 is already a very significant improvement. Next slide, please. And here are our results. Um, as you can see on the graph, the blue bar represents the average precision values of the baseline model, uh, which corresponds to the first row in the table. And the red bar represents the average precision values of the adding synthetic model, which corresponds to the second row in the table. And a number above the red bar is the absolute increase in average precision after we added synthetic images. And as you can see, adding synthetic images show substantial improvements in all our experimental settings. In the within domain setting, we have a relative performance gain of close to 6% in average precision. And in the cross domain setting, we have even higher, over 12% relative in, um, performance gain from adding synthetic in terms of uh, average positions. And what this means is that in the cross domain settings, this corresponds to where we test an uh, image, we, we train the model with non target domain images and with synthetic images on the target domain and test it on the target domain. And in the real world setting, this means synthetic images can be very helpful in the real world when we have a lack of data on the regions that we'd like to apply the model to. And next slide, please. And here are some example test images from East to Midwest. And the baseline model is the case when we train with only real Northeast images. Uh, and the adding synthetic uh, model is the case when we train with real Northeast images and synthetic East to Midwest images, and we test the model on East to Midwest. So as you can see on the left, there's an architecture, which is not a wind turbine, but the baseline model thinks that there are three wind turbines there while the adding synthetic model is, uh, hasn't made this mistake. And in this case, um, from the same experimental setting, the baseline model thinks that the shadow of the wind turbine is the wind turbine, while the adding synthetic one didn't make this mistake. And in this case, on the upper left corner, there's the wind turbine. Uh, the adding synthetic model from the same experimental setting is able to see that there is actually a wind turbine, while the baseline model is not able to. Our key takeaway, therefore, is that synthetic imagery can really help the object detection model to generalize across different geographical settings and can help, especially when we, don't, we have a lack of real data and when it's cost prohibited to collect and label more real data. Next slide, please. And because of this uh, promising improvement brought by synthetic imagery, our method has great potential to be applied to regions across the world where there are low or no access to electricity. So even if we cannot get sufficient label images of these diverse geographies of these regions, with synthetic imagery that can be easily generated by taking overhead images of the regions we'd like to apply the model to, and the model performs better, our model can potentially map out the energy infrastructure of the region at ease, and we can hence help local stakeholders there to optimize their energy access planning with such information provided by the model. And next, I will transition to Wendy, who will talk about future work. Thanks, Ada. Um, so now that we've discussed our project, we'd like to discuss a few areas where future research could be done. First, while our project focused on wind turbines, there are, in fact, quite a few types of energy infrastructure that we'd be able to, uh, we would like to be able to apply our research to. Uh, so, for instance, substations, transmission towers, and solar panels are all types of energy infrastructure that are uh, that we would like to be able to run our pipeline on, and we can do this by fine-tuning our synthetic generation process to match new types of infrastructure. So, for instance, by downloading three-dimensional models of solar panels and um, creating synthetic imagery that way. Next, we would also like to explore few shot learning, which is a technique that allows us to use uh, small amounts of real images uh, and combine that with large amounts of synthetic data. And if this were possible, it would uh, be even more um, cost effective in terms of 
um, solving our problem, which is scarcity of data. And finally, uh, another area that would be interesting to explore is generating uh, synthetic images using um, GANs, which are generative adversarial networks. And this is the technique in which you transfer the style of one image onto another image. So if we were able to generate, say, synthetic images of wind turbines by learning from the uh, images of wind turbines we already have, that would be uh, a really great way to further automate the process. So in conclusion, um, as Ada discussed in the takeaway section, there are a few, uh, a few points that our project was able to address. Firstly, uh, the automated identification of energy infrastructure through satellite images enables uh, the automation of this whole process uh, by addressing the scarcity of data. And secondly, um, we were able to enhance performance as well as cross-domain generalization by adding in synthetic images of wind turbines. And finally, this information is able to enable policymakers to deploy energy resources, especially in low access regions, um, to expand energy access. So we would like to thank all of you guys for coming to our presentation. And we would like to thank uh, Dr. Kyle Bradbury, Dr. Jordan Mayloff and Wayne, of course, for their help and guidance uh, along the way. And we would also like to thank previous Fast Connections and Data Plus teams for all of their work in collecting images, developing models, and uh, doing the work that our project was really based on. And finally, we would like to thank all of the guest speakers who came to our class to share their work um, and engage with our project along the way. Thank you all for coming and we really enjoyed working on this project. Um, we'll open the floor to any questions if there are questions now. Thank you.